and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that uh, finally concedes that cable TV was indeed much better when it was just a handful of channels. And with that in mind, today let's take a very, very selective look back at the first real proper super station, as it were, TBS. And of course, in its heyday, TBS really was kind of the ultimate independent UHF station, an art that's unfortunately long lost at this point. But anyway, I mentioned selective. So if you saw my episode on the USA Network a few years ago, I was doing some pretty good cherry picking with that one. And it's going to be that much worse this time. So this is going to be, with one exception, what I wish to celebrate about TBS. And the one part that I don't care so much about, and I'll note it when I get there, is just way too significant to not cover. So anyway, let's turn the clock all the way back to the absolute roots of this station back in 1967, and we'll just kind of arbitrarily end things right around the end of the 80s, early 90s at the latest. The seeds for the TBS network were sown in September of 1967, via the Atlanta-based UHF station WJRJ Channel 17, named after founder Jack Rice Jr. Despite being such a major population center, WJRJ was only Atlanta's second-ever commercial UHF station. The first, WQXI, only lasted about six months between 1954 and 55. Otherwise, WETV, public broadcasting, was the only thing on UHF in the area. Initially, WJRJ aired only eight hours a day. Their roster consisted of a few 50s and early 60s TV reruns, mostly sitcoms, a relative handful of primarily 30s and 40s feature films, some stray sports stuff, and a daily 15-minute news program. One could argue that the station's ambitions got the better of them. Within their first 12 to 15 months, WJRJ added any show that the local three major network stations didn't want, including Jeopardy! and One Life to Live, plus taking on whatever syndicated shows they could get the rights to. For their efforts, WJRJ lost over $300,000, over $2.5 million adjusted for inflation, in their first year. In the summer of 1969, as a second year of similar financial losses became imminent, Jack Rice merged with a young entrepreneur by the name of Ted Turner. You might have heard of him. At the time, Turner was carrying on his late father's quite successful billboard advertising company and was starting to try out other forms of media, including buying a few radio stations in the region. Through a stock exchange, Turner acquired about 75% of Rice's company. In April of 1970, WJRJ formally turned over to Ted Turner and Turner's request to change the station's call letters to WTCG went into effect. Sometime between July 4th and August 1st, that call letter change went into effect. For what it's worth, WTCG officially stood for W. Turner Communications Group, but informally and much more famously stood for Watch This Channel Grow. If WTCG's early listings are anything to go by, Turner seemed content to mostly continue with WJRJ's existing lineup, just with a little more in the way of more recent reruns and more sports. Anyway, there's conflicting info about this, but allegedly WJRJ only broadcast in black and white, in spite of the local newspaper's TV listings. If the station lore is indeed true, Turner kicked the station over to color within a few months of taking over the station. 
One thing that is true, though, is that within a couple of years, WTCG started broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. From the get-go, Ted Turner had his sights set on getting his new station picked up by every cable TV system in the region. And it seemed to work. By mid-1973, WTCG was being seen as far away as Salisbury, North Carolina, roughly 280 miles away. With the launch of HBO's satellite uplink in September of 1975, and by turn going national, Turner set his sights on WTCG going national, and succeeded. On December 17, 1976, WTCG uplinked their programming to SATCOM 1, incidentally the same satellite that HBO was using, and went sort of national, landing on four cable systems, the farthest out being Grand Island, Nebraska. Having said that, WTCG soon landed on many, many more systems, making them the first proper so-called super station. As an amusing side note, WTCG was also offered to cable systems to run only during the overnight hours when other stations were off the air. In 1979, WTCG became WTBS, meaning Turner Broadcasting System, and in 1987, WTBS simply became, colloquially at least, TBS. Yes, hooray for Hollywood and all the great films they made for so many years. We really have movies. I think we can safely say that TBS is best remembered for its seemingly endless stream of reruns and old movies. Of course, compared to most, TBS had some more choice programming. As it stood in the early 70s, film libraries available to TV were available to license for no more than a few years at a time, generally. When the rights to a library would expire, invariably other stations wouldn't want them for a while because, more than likely, they had been recently broadcast right into the ground. As such, Ted Turner was able to snag the rights to those recently ended film packages for often about half of what they had cost the previous station. Turner was also much more liberal about licensing, especially black and white films, from the 30s and 40s, as most TV stations at the time preferred to run color films from the 50s on. By the late 70s, Turner had accrued north of 2,700 titles to run whenever he wanted. As such, Turner was able to run thematic blocks of movies with great ease, such as all Academy Award winners, or movies from a very specific genre, or from a specific year, and so on and so forth. Of course, most infamously, in 1985, Turner bought the rights to the, up until that point, current MGM catalog, which also included all pre-1950 Warner Brothers films to boot. Twice as infamously, Turner attempted to colorize some of the more famous black and white films in the lot. But in the name of brevity, we'll just let that matter slide today. Anyway, throughout the 70s and 80s, TBS ran several movies every single day of the year. Be back tomorrow, kids, because you won't want to miss a minute of all the fun with the Rascals, the Three Stooges, and all their pals. On the rerun front, Turner acquired the rights to numerous, especially sitcoms, the same way he did movies. Let the major local channels run them for a few years, once they drop them, pick them up cheap, and run them nationally. By the end of the 70s, WTBS, by this point, had accrued Star Trek, The Andy Griffith Show, Three Stooges Shorts, and a handful of others this way. We'll revisit the reruns once more before the end of today's episode. It'll be clear and colder on Friday night with a low around 30, then on Saturday sunny and cool. Hope that holds up with a high expected around 50 degrees. I'd like to show you our satellite radar weather picture, but I didn't get time to stop by the drugstore and pick it up tonight. 
Admittedly, this segment is the main reason why I wanted to make this episode. Sometime in the early days of making this show, I stumbled upon a compilation of in-house clips from 1975 of then WTCG's early morning newscasts, featuring some casually dressed random guy on an ultra-plain, green-screened bargain basement set reading the news, and at times seemingly straight from the local paper. And he would continually interject snide remarks, obviously fake news stories, and would spar with his tiny and very smart-ass crew. The anchor's name kind of seemed like an alias to boot. Bill Tush. Tush? Tush? Anyway. Uh, needless to say, I was instantly hooked. Well, as I soon found out, Bill Tush was slash is a very real person. From about 1974 to 86, Tush was, at varying times, the station's primary on-air announcer, periodic local commercial pitchman, the head of their news department, star of his own sketch comedy show, and was their resident film historian and morning movie host. But let's stick with Tush's two big contributions to the station his early morning newscasts, and his short-lived sketch comedy show, simply titled Tush. What you see there are the leftovers. And I'm going to figure out a way to get in there. For the First National Bank, the Buckhead Branch, I'm Bill Tush. Thank you, Bill. As the story goes, in the name of keeping in the FCC's good graces, still being a local channel in spite of their wide reach, the station was still very much obligated to provide some news programming. Being the station's main on-air talent, Bill Tush wound up assuming anchor duties. The station's main news program was called Early in the Morning, which was actually quickly taped the previous evening just before everyone clocked out. The newscast would then get quietly aired as a 20-minute filler sometime during the 3 o'clock hour every morning. Now, initially, like many overnight newscasts of the period, early in the morning was initially audio only. Alas, as of early 2024, none of these newscasts have surfaced. Anyway, in 1975, Ted Turner asked Tush if he wanted to start doing his newscast on camera. Tush accepted, and the ultra-basic aesthetic of the audio-only newscasts was carried over. At some point, little moments of less-than-professional behavior started to seep their way into the newscast. Ted Turner happened to catch it one night, and told Tush he thought it was funny. And as such, early in the morning soon became a nightly free-for-all, involving mini-sketches, on-set pranks, and most importantly, their very own the news chicken. The WTCG news chicken has just spotted a foul. The news chicken arrived here to investigate a report of two arrows painted on the street in front of the shopping center. As you can see, with the arrows painted in this manner, it would be quite easy for two cars driven by two dense people to be involved in a head-on... This is WTCG Update with Bill Tush. Hello, I hope you're doing okay today. Let's look at the weather forecast for Atlanta as it is over much of the nation today, calling for cold weather. It is worth noting that, at some point, WTCG started running little news updates during the day, in which usually Tush, and usually in a nice suit, would deliver a perfectly decent straight news update. ...chance of succeeding. The Soviet Union is hailing the defeat of the Khmer Rouge government as a victory for the people of Cambodia. And this week's show is just about careers, like we said. No, Bill. And we're all going to go over to my place now that the show's over? No way, Bill. By 1980, Tush's graveyard shift newscasts became such a cult favorite that Tush was offered his own sketch comedy show, simply titled Tush. To be blunt, though it has its moments, I don't consider the sketch show to be nearly as funny as Tush's Graveyard Shift newscasts. Bill isn't much of an actor either, and unsurprisingly takes a back seat to the rest of the surprisingly large cast. 
the main reason to pull up episodes of this show on YouTube, and most of them are indeed there, is to watch a young pre-SNL Jan Hooks starting to really find her way as a comedian. Unsurprisingly, Tush only lasted 19 episodes. And promote it. The secret is my husband wrote it. And that you bought it shows me what a fool you are. I don't believe you think she's attractive. Oh yeah, sure. Unlike most online personalities, Ben took Oddity Archive through the back door of online video, specifically the now defunct blip.tv. As a quick final note, when it was time for the archive's 200th episode back in the summer of 2020, I wanted Bill Tush to do the narration, but I was admittedly too news chicken to try and contact him and I got stuck with whoever that two-bit documentarian that uh, directed that episode got on Fiverr. Hi, now you can have this five foot three inch natural blonde with only a slight complexion problem for an evening on the town, or this macho guy with a receding hairline for your escort any night of the week. That's right, the small blonde or the slightly heavy man. It's your choice, only $250 at unclaimed date. Unclaimed date. Northside Iron Mario Hill, Hayfield. Financial troubles down on the farm forced Timmy's family to eat Lassie. Tomorrow morning on Super 70. And here we go with that segment that I have no real interest in, but is just too significant to pass by. I, I'm clearly not smart enough to understand the pure artistry that is professional wrestling. Anyway, Georgia Championship Wrestling, henceforth GCW, dated all the way back to the World War II era, but didn't make its broadcast debut until 1971 on Atlanta's local ABC station. Within a year, Ted Turner spirited the organization over to WTCG, where it aired every Saturday and quickly became the station's most viewed program, especially after the station went national in late 76. According to, funnily enough, Bill Tush, Every Friday night, the GCW crew would come in and quickly and sloppily set up folding chairs around a really basic ring, and the crowd would start to roll in at 8 a.m. Saturday morning. And invariably, even at that hour, the crowd would already be, uh, shall we say, uh, loosened up. Between the complete and utter lack of budget and the uh, rather spirited crowd, it made for a rather unique atmosphere. Thank you very, very much. A very spirited crowd here today at the television sports arena. First of all, let me just say, too, that a little bit later on, we're going to be seeing Dusty Rhodes in action. That's right, the American Dream Georgia heavyweight champion. I want all the people to know from Georgia that they have a new Georgia champion. Within the history of wrestling, GCW is noteworthy for indirectly launching the WWF, or WWE, as a staple of cable TV. By the end of 1983, a series of ownership consolidations brought GCW down to only two owners, the Briscoe Brothers who are apparently quite famous in the wrestling world. I'd never heard of them prior to this. Anyway, in the summer of 1984, the Briscoe brothers sold GCW to the new-ish owner of the WWF, some dude named Vince McMahon, and did so for the princely sum of $900,000. In addition to buying the organization itself, it also gave McMahon the now WTBS time slot that came with it, by turn giving WWF the then most widely viewed national slot for wrestling. 
Having said that, the performers, if you will, were so disgusted by the sellout that all but one of them quit in protest. Ted Turner wasn't happy about it either. He wanted live, or at least tape-delayed, new wrestling every week. The WWF instead gave him nothing but best-of reels. The WWF material on WTBS ended in March of 1985. Funnily enough, Turner replaced WWF with the smaller Jim Crockett Promotions, which in 1988 evolved into WCW, or World Championship Wrestling. Read WWF's then main competitor. If you will, let's meet and greet Brown, get down with the dive's most dynamic song out there today. The number one disco thing, and we call it Body Heat. One of the great cliches about independent TV stations during the 70s through 90s was the presence of a little show called Soul Train. As in, as the joke went, it truly wasn't an independent unless they ran at least one cheap fishing show and Soul Train. Well, WTCG slash WTBS couldn't get Soul Train. So instead, they reached out to local legend James Brown to host their own answer to Soul Train. And that would be Future Shock, which ran from 1976 to 79 and also got syndicated nationally. Funnily enough, for all of James Brown's talent, he was far better at being a musician than an MC or worse yet, an interviewer. There are a couple of episodes and some stray bits on YouTube, and it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that Future Shock was never going to be a threat to Soul Train. Right now we have someone that I'm very fond of and I respect very much, and I had the pleasure of visiting with her at uh, Tuskegee Institute. Um, Mrs. Elaine Thomas, director curator, uh, for George Washington Carver Museum, Tuskegee Institute. And the contribution you made by Dr. Carver, uh... Hey, where'd you get that ring? This is a party ring. Sure is bad. Hey, you got a party ring too. Yeah. And with a different stone. Everybody's got a party ring. Okay, not actual programming, but I do think it's quite significant that this station was really the one that got PI ads, or per inquiry ads, firmly lodged into the mainstream. Now, of course, these are the mini infomercials that came to heavily populate off peak, off network TV from the 70s through the 2000s. You know, the ads I like to make fun of on this little show, and that the record ripoffs intros are all based on. Anyway, in the case of WTBS, speaking generically, it wound up being an especially lucrative double dip for Ted Turner, who would run regular local ads on the station's terrestrial feed and load up the commercial breaks on the national feed with these PI ads. You can thank WTBS for firmly lodging the Ginsu Knives, Armor Coat Cookware, Slim Whitman albums, and Boxcar Willie albums into the American consciousness. Six different rings because it comes complete with six interchangeable simulated stones. And the ring itself is a beautiful work of gold-plated art. So don't miss out. Here's how to get yours. To order, send $5.95 to Party Ring Box 7500. That's Party Ring Box 7500. Gary Grant runs a tight ship. Is she going down right? Mm -hmm. She sure is. I can only speak for myself here, but I distinctly remember TBS getting quickly embedded into my psyche as a kid. Not so much because of the programming, but because their shows always started at weird times, either 5 or 35 minutes past the hour. As it turns out, this was another one of Ted Turner's attempts at standing out from the crowd. Since we still see the grid-styled program listings on cable and satellite systems today, we're used to it. We're used to seeing shows not falling neatly into a grid. But back when Turner Time, as it was dubbed, was launched in 1981, 
It threw people off when perusing their old school paper TV guides, not to mention probably screwed with the people that had to write those things every week. And there was another purpose to it, and that was to buy channel surfers a little extra time to not miss the beginning of a TBS program after watching something on another channel. Not to mention they were probably hoping they could get you hooked. For what it's worth, perhaps tellingly, as TBS began to lose its identity back in the late 90s, TBS began to phase out Turner time. Since the early 2000s, if the station is running a block of movies, the time slot for a new show may happen at 15 or 45 minutes past the hour, but that's about it. Keyfax presents The Shopping Trip. Given my history with it, I don't think I'll get away with not touching on this. Beginning in November of 1982, quietly tucked away in the vertical blanking interval, or VBI, of their signal, WTBS carried the first and best remembered, which isn't saying much, crack at bringing the concept of teletext, text-based news and information, to the U.S., of course, this would be the interactive Keyfax service. Sometime in 1985, WTBS kicked over to Taft Broadcasting's not-so-interactive stab at teletext, Electra. Depending on your source, it lasted on the station until 1988, when it lost most of its financial backing, or it lasted all the way to the service's bitter end in 1993. Now, of course, Keyfax needed a quite large outboard converter box and a pricey monthly subscription, so that never really got off the ground. Electra decoders were built into Zenith brand TVs for a few years, but thanks to a total lack of marketing, most people that had those TVs likely weren't even aware of Electra. Getting back to Keyfax, I did a full episode on that back in 2021, called Keyfax Rides Again. And in short, yeah, I do have an apparently quite rare Keyfax box, but I wasn't able to pull up more than a couple of lines of very corrupt data from either of my two period-correct WTBS tapes, as the signal on home video gear of that time simply isn't stable enough to keep the data intact. A later attempt at pulling the data with a supposedly compatible universal remote also proved fruitless. As for Electra, a period-correct Zenith TV to test with my couple of period-correct TBS tapes has just never been forthcoming, and even then I have serious doubts about recovering the data. Let's close things out on a decidedly silly note here. The biggest constant of WJRJ slash WTCG slash WTBS slash TBS has always been the presence of sitcom reruns. For whatever reason, in 1989, primarily spotlighting the same old sitcoms they'd been running since the early 70s, TBS ran an especially splashy ad campaign called TB Yes, which kind of sounds like hooray for tuberculosis to my ear. Anyway, in their attempt at adding a new sheen to the same old programming, Ted Turner brought in every actor from these sitcoms he could get to appear in these ads. The catch was, unless the actors were in the guise of their old characters, they could be a bit tough to pick out. But of course, the real punchline to this was that TB Yes wasn't explicitly intended to plug their same old sitcom reruns, but it sure gave that impression. TB Yes was quietly dropped in 1990, right about the same time they dropped their famous Superstation moniker. Wonder if there's a connection. Next, Lily opens a beauty parlor on the Munsters. Then, Florida pickets her supermarket on good times. 
TV, yes, next. In a weird way, TBS, which doesn't even have a local version anymore, has come full circle, and then some. So, as it turns out, as of my making this, they are down to one original program, and it's not even one they created, and that would be American Dad, which I had no idea was even still a thing. But uh, anyway, I was able to check their schedule, you know, two weeks out, and... Yeah, it's down to just a small handful of sitcoms, and I think I counted 10 movies just getting run over and over and over again. And uh, indeed, I, I admittedly still have cable, and I went and I checked on TBS, and it seemed a little off to me. Well, I went and looked online, and as it turns out, they are speeding up the programs by about 8% now, so they can cram that many more commercials in there. And I thought USA Network's fate was depressing. Anyway, that's going to be it for today's archive. Join me next time when I take a page from the TBS playbook and I discontinue any further new episodes of Oddity Archive. I'm going to maximize my profits. So starting next week, you're going to see a single public domain cartoon played at double speed in perpetuity with a commercial break every 15 seconds or so worth of program. I'm going to go pick out my personal jet and my own private island now. Been nice knowing ya. Cable's first sensation. TBS won't count. Super celebration. TBS, you and me. The one to see. TBS, TBS. Lighten up the nation. Roaches are nasty, but here's a way to wipe out roaches and water bugs. It's a safe, easy, and non-messy way to put a stop to the problem. It's Mr. Sticky, the Roach Hunter. Non-poisonous, non-aerosol, no odor, and completely safe around children, pets, and food areas. It's so easy to use. All you have to do is peel off the wax paper, fold the tops together, and set inside closets, under sinks, bathrooms, anywhere a roach problem might be suspected. Mr. Sticky, the roach hunter, attracts and traps roaches for up to three months. And then all you have to do is throw Mr. Sticky away.